we are live. Welcome to this edition of the Times Techies webinar series. Today's session is in association with NASCOM and in particular with NASCOM's Deep Tech Club. My name is Sujit John and I have with me my colleague Shilpa Fadnis. We are technology and business reporters at TOI and both of us have been with TOI for a long time. The two of us will moderate this discussion. We'll be discussing the deep tech ecosystem in India. A lot of India's entrepreneurial success in the technology industry to date has come from business model innovations. Deep tech is about scientific research and innovative engineering, which then leads to the creation of highly innovative technology products and ventures. We'll go into those definitions a little later with the panelists. India is beginning to see some good successes in this space to discuss this ecosystem and to discuss how to create a deep tech mindset. We have with us today professionals who have been involved in the space a very long time. They are excellent technologists themselves. We have with us Rohini Srivatsa. Rohini has been on this platform before. Rohini is National Technology Officer at Microsoft's India Operations. She is responsible for leading strategic initiatives to accelerate digital transformation across industries and government. Rohini began her career in R&D at AT&T Bell Laboratories in the US. Prior to joining Microsoft, she was in strategy consulting at the Boston Consulting Group and IBM Global Business Services. Welcome, Rohini. We have with us Atul Patra. Atul is the chair of the NASCOM Product Council and a member of the NASCOM Executive Council. Atul has been a great source for us in identifying outstanding product companies in India so that we can showcase them on the Times Techies page. Atul is the CTO of Algonomy, previously Manthan. Algonomy is a globally successful venture from India. It offers SaaS-based analytics and AI products and customer engagement solutions that are used by retail and consumer businesses in over 25 countries. Welcome, Atul. Thank you. Atul has also been on this platform before. Uh, we have with us Sunil Gupta. Sunil is co-founder and CEO of Q New Labs. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Sunil. Kiru Labs is a quantum security technology company. Today's crypto cryptography-based security can become easily hackable when quantum computers come in. Tunu has quantum technology-based security solutions that ensure hack-proof communications. Tunu has customers across uh, defense, government, financial sector, and data center and cloud service providers. Prior to Tunu, Sunil was president and CEO at Palladian Networks, and prior to that with Infosys Edgeverb. Logica, Symphony Services, and Arisant. Welcome, Sunil. Thank and you. we have with us Vinay MK. Vinay is VP and R&D of Path Partner Technologies. Path Partner is a product engineering firm. They help their clients develop, productize, and maintain advanced technology products. They have hardware products like camera modules, software products like image algorithms. They develop medical products, IOE products. Vinay is also the co-founder of Zopi, a wireless enterprise-grade meeting room solution. Welcome, Vinay. Hey, thank you, Shilpa. Those who are viewing this can send in quest questions yeah. to the Facebook comment box. Shilpa and I will put them to the panelists. Um, let me ask by asking, um, start by asking Rohini and Atul. Uh, firstly, how would you define deep tech? And uh, why do you think nurturing deep tech is important for India? Rohini, you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to start and Atul, you can join. Uh, so I think um, just, a, just a step back, right? I think uh, we all uh, have been in the technology world for, for a long time. And when we say deep tech, uh, you have to understand what is driving it. Uh, I would say that, uh, of course, as uh, as uh, as you know, the Moore's law has has driven the compute cost to zero, uh, and the pandemic world, we see the digitization has really accelerated, and we've seen that ourselves. And if you look at the country, the kind of smartphone present penetration in the country, uh, the number of uh, people with with Aadhaar's identity, uh, the number of UPI transactions happening more than two billion. What that does is it creates digitization and it creates data. That then drives areas of deep tech. And when I talk about deep tech, I'm talking about areas around artificial intelligence, around edge computing, around 5G, which will which is around the corner, around things that you do with data in the virtual, in the interplay of digital and physical worlds, around uh, mixed reality and augmented reality, some of those things. And of course, quantum computing has something coming along, along the line. So these are technology areas, but then their relevance in the world uh, in, in the economy in terms of really adding value uh, is becoming much, much more accelerated given the 
pace at which uh, uh, digitization and data is, is growing in the world. Now, having said that, I think the, the other point you asked is that why is deep tech important for, for, for us? Uh, and if I give you a Microsoft point of view, right? We think of ourselves as a platform company whose, jo whose main job and main reason for existence is to help others innovate. And innovation, uh, and particularly startups, play a key role in that uh, in that uh, part of you know being the innovation and agile. So our ability to uh, work with startups, help them innovate through using uh, whether it is cognitive services or uh, or other technologies uh, in an agile manner, which is what most startups today who are getting into the uh, into the world are mobile first, cloud first kind of organizations, right? Their ability to be agile and go to market quickly is where we think, think of uh, our, our, our reason to be. And then finally, there's about scale. Our ability to work with these startups to go to market both in India and across the world is where we see as the main reason why we would say our value add to the technology and the broader economical eco economic ecosystem becomes. So I think it's both a question of where India has, uh, has reached from perspective of its own journey on the digital and data wave, and therefore such an important time for being in the deep tech world. And our role in that, because we see such an amazing confluence, if you will, as to what we can do for this ecosystem in terms of innovation, scale, and agility. Atul? Yeah. So firstly, uh, Sujit and Shilpa, I want to thank you for doing great service to the ecosystem and the nation, I would say, by highlighting our deep tech entrepreneurs and the importance of deep tech to the economy and, and you know, the country. So I just want to echo what Rohini said and just, uh, you know, as background, right? Uh, you know, we've done great building out our IT services industry, as we know, right? And BPM, BPO and the other sectors over the last couple of decades and really making India the global leader there. And as we know, the next wave for our industry now is around products and startups. And I mean, if we look back in just under a decade, decade and a half since, you know, we formalized kind of our ecosystem in India, you know, we are already the third largest startup ecosystem, right? So now the focus is not just on quantity, but quality. And as we've discussed in the past, you know, our strength, and like Rohini said, is in talent and scale. And, uh, you know, scale, not just in terms of number of engineers, but the kind of fundamental problems that exist in our part of the world where we can apply technology and innovation, you know, to solve for India, but also for the world, right? But, uh, you know, what I want to say is, you know, at the root of realizing our sort of this potential is fundamentally this thing called innovation. And, you know, I always like to assert, you know, when was the last time you heard India and innovation, and forgive me for saying that, mentioned in the same breath, right? And if you look back, you know, 1,000 plus years back, we had nearly 30% of the world's GDP. We were one of the world leaders in innovation. So, you know, what we're trying to do now is make a small attempt to start to climb back to that sort of pole position again. And, uh, you know, like Rohini said, deep tech is that new innovation. And it's basically a combination of any frontier technology, and we define it very broadly, Sujit and Shilpa, you know, around, you know, family of AI technologies from machine learning, NLP, computer vision, et cetera, two things like IoT, AR, VR, robotics, quantum, we have Sunil here, you know, blockchain, et cetera. So anything kind of forward looking. And, you know, I argue that deep tech is the biggest disruption in the history of mankind, perhaps, you know, it's reinventing us as a species. I think the, you know, the prediction is in the next 10 years, innovation will exceed the innovation in the past several hundred years, right? So it's getting accelerated all the time. And as we know, you know, today technology is already transforming our economy. It's transforming every, you know, business, every industry vertical, whether it's healthcare, fintech, retail, manufacturing, and it has potential, potential for large scale impact to, you know, also societal problems in India, you know, like poverty, health, literacy, et cetera, right? So, you know, we started this deep tech club at NASCOM uh, you know, about four years back to make India innovation powerhouse again, right? And so D Deep Tech Club, you know, I just want to give some story that was bootstrapped, uh, you know, with one goal and by some really visionary people that were part of the NASCOM product council, like Subindra Kurana, Milan, Hanchanmani, you know, and I think NASCOM at that point, four years back was visionary to start such a focused initiative, uh, you know, before the whole concept of Deep Tech became mainstream, at least in India, right? And the idea was a very simple, but a good one to nurture and scale India innovation on the global stage, right? 
and we started small and you know we have uh, till date consciously mentored about 80 startups you know people like sunil and vinay and they'll talk about you know what the experience has been but the and the club has not just been about mentoring you know we've had uh, you know and we've had 100 very capable mentors paying it forward and a huge community of hundreds of supporters from the ecosystem that are driving you know industry connects helping with funding uh, things like go to market market access product strategy etc and you know i'm very happy to kind of give the report card we have done uh, you know in the several years we've done over 1000 years of uh, th 1000 uh, investor connect meetings we've done over a thousand enterprise connects for our, you know, what we call our mentees, the startup companies, over a thousand hours of personalized mentoring, right? So we've achieved some scale here. And I, I think we're just warming up here. And now, you know, we have, it's very interesting. If you look at the data, we have companies bucketed in, you know, cybersecurity, aviation, automotive, things like FinTech, you know, uh, certainly retail e-commerce, uh, things like surveillance, right? Which became very, uh, interesting during the pandemic in particular you know manufacturing the whole health sector the bharat sector right the voice were video vernacular right so it's fairly broad so the next stage for us you know from you know kind of as a community in nascom is is about scaling and so recently we unveiled deep tech club 2.0 which will be driven as a partnership model in addition to the current program and its benefits right and so we are onboarding deep tech focused global partners from across the world that will include incubators, accelerators, tech companies and platforms, investors, businesses, uh, you know, research and academia, very important part of it. And I'm sure we'll have a bigger discussion there, you know, governments, right, in terms of policy. And we've had some great launch partners so far, you know, Cisco, Intel, IIT Bombay, Kanpur, uh, you know, T-Hub out of Hyderabad, you know, uh, global VC sitting out of the US like Dallas VC. And, you know, if, if we take several steps back, the vision again is to create the largest umbrella. And this is a very audacious goal sitting out of India, the largest umbrella for deep tech globally, bringing together a community comprising the entrepreneurs, tech companies, businesses, investors, research and academia and governments together, right? And so the mission is to make India a world leader in deep tech products. And the goal is you know, we have a quantified goal to impact 1,000 deep tech startups in the next five years out of India. And I think we've had a good start, you know, thanks to the community. And I would say it's still day zero. And I guess, you know, I've heard this from people like uh, Arogya Swami, Paul Raj and all that. There's this huge battle going on between the US and China on exactly these frontier technologies that you mentioned. And uh, China, he said, is kind of going berserk, uh, kind of number of AI papers that are presented in a conference, the Chinese present more than anybody else, it seems. Uh, so given that kind of, I mean, oh, they obviously see massive advantages in investing in these kind of technologies. So all the more important for uh, India, I guess, to make these investments and uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Shilpa? Yeah, coming to uh, Sunil and Vinay, uh, India is well poised to become a deep tech powerhouse. If you can help us understand um, what's the roadmap for it and your own experience working with NASCOM to put India on the global map. Yeah, hi, Shilpa, so, uh, Sunil here. Uh, uh, so uh, just a brief on QNU. Uh, so we are a, a, a global front runner and to offer uh, quantum secure products and solutions uh, uh, to the global uh, world. Uh, so, uh, so our journey started about four years ago and we were actually an incubating company out of uh, IIT Madras Research Park. And, uh, and for our journey, uh, it uh, actually it was slightly different than uh, probably most of the other deep tech companies in the sense that uh, uh, we had another phase, uh, starting phase, which is uh, different from other companies that where we had to uh, do a proof of science, right? Where there is a fundamental uh, R&D was involved uh, because we were talking about quantum physics and we had no idea about, though we had a professor who is a master in quantum physics from IIT Madras as our co-founder, but uh, most of the team had to understand about what this uh, science is about, how, because we were talking about a different paradigm, right? We don't talk about bits here, we talk about quantum bits, how do they work, what is superposition, how do we get that state and so on. And uh, so that particular part where proof of science that how do we understand the science into a meaningful way that it can be converted into a tech. So for us, the first value of death, I typically call it the two values of death in the deep tech world. 
first valley of death comes in when you actually understand science and make a meaningful product where you can say that it really meets the uh, you know it's basically a product that can actually go to a go to market so it was it was very uh, difficult the very challenge uh, because uh, at that point of time um, there were no benchmarks there were no other company we were the first and the only company so we didn't any you know lessons from from somebody else and we had to do everything from scratch uh, in fact uh, identifying components and figuring out what the source for the component so whole supply chain um, so the first one year was all experiments we were looking at science doing experiments and learning science so once we got in the we were fortunate to have some of the uh, startups uh, so the two startups that uh, the accelerator program that came into our uh, early phase that helped us come out of this first valley of death where we take science into a uh, meaningful product right so once we got the uh, product i call it proof of uh, tech then the next uh, challenge was for us to really figure out that how do we take it to the customer we i call it a proof of business right where somebody would pay us for the, that particular product so for that the challenge came in that it was a so 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 complex technology right it is so difficult to explain to a, a customer who is who is from the classical world right and you explain them a quantum uh, tech it was a very very complex thing that is where nascom a deep tech club really helped it was a it was a i would say a, a boon to us because uh, some of the mentors like shobinder vinod sood and uh, others they helped us really articulate that how do we articulate a quantum tech in a common man language right otherwise we were struggling in the beginning that really helped uh, helped us to come out of the second valley of tech where we actually got early adopters early customers and then once we got that and then of course the next part is that uh, proof of scale right uh, which we are uh, work in progress so when you look at a deep tech especially when you are on the first and the only player in this your your challenge becomes far bigger and uh, so building an ecosystem was a very big challenge uh, building a technology partners building a, a academia partners even finding a first set of people as a core team <laughs> because there was no talent pool in india in terms of who knew the technology right so we had to build from from scratch and then building a product that can actually meet uh, military criteria because our first customers were defense customers and then uh, building a supply chain and manufacturing partners uh, right and uh, and now we are probably full fledged uh, uh, ecosystem available to us where we have go to market partners in india and abroad and uh, so so it was a it was a good journey a very a um, uh, uh, lot of learning on the way uh, eventually success to us came from ecosystem right where we got all the people all the different uh, pieces got together and of course government also played an important role <laughs> we got um, uh, tdb uh, loan uh, technology development board for uh, from dst to help us scale up our manufacturing so we got that uh, funding uh, we got ourselves on government e marketplace uh, uh, registered ourselves so our first orders have just come from government e market portal so i think the government uh, also became a partner in our journey and then quantum mission that were launched last year also helped us um, and uh, we hope that this ecosystem that we have put together i am very positive about it and very very uh, gungo about it that the ecosystem that we have struggled to put together we really help a lot of other startups in this space uh, uh, to come up and benefit from it so so it help us understand where does quantum stand today i mean um, are there people using quantum computer of course we heard about google doing all those kind of stuff and all that but uh, in actual practice are people using quantum computers and quantum technologies so so yeah so so there are two parts to it one is the quantum computers which are building uh, using quantum physics uh, to build uh, computers that can solve problem that classical computers can't solve right for example drug discovery optimization finding supernovas you know finding new materials and so on right because they are they they can solve certain problems in uh, in a much uh, exponential faster time than the classical computers can so so there is a whole different world but with the problem that we are trying to solve by the way the quantum computers are going big way 5 years ago people said the quantum computers will take another 30 years and today we are at least saying the quantum computers will be there in the next 3 to 5 years nobody imagined that a uh, 6 months ago ibm will go out and announce that they will have a 1000 qubit computer by 2023 people thought that 5 years ago people thought that 1000 qubit quantum computer will come by 20 2030 <laughs> right so it accelerated almost by 5 to 7 years right 
And but what problem we solve because of quantum computers coming in having this this uh, you know exceptional power, the all the cryptography that protects our internet banking, mobile banking, healthcare, everything will be broken. So we are building a defensive technology that if quantum computing uh, game become a reality, which we believe will become much sooner, then how do we prepare enterprises and, and everybody else to, to protect their data as Rani was saying is all about data going forward, right? And digi digitized world. How do we protect a world when in the 5G world, you'll be surprised one of our very interesting discussion with largest player in India in 5G is going along that how do we protect their indigenous 5G network using our, our technology, right? So, so we are actually sitting in a world which is probably a two or three years away from uh, the, I would say the full fledged so customers were already taking these proactive steps in oh, the yeah. expectation that quantum computers will one day hack into you. We have Indian defense government already deploying as we speak. Uh, we have uh, customers in, in Middle East. Uh, we, we have customers, uh, big banks and a lot of other customers already deploying it in the US as well, US and Europe. So it's already a work in progress. So right now, having said that, right now it's early adopters, right? Who have to do it, they cannot, cannot wait for uh, quantum computers to come. They have to take a proactive step, right? Um, so, and I think soon we will see the, the followers and the, and the okay. other. If I may add a small yeah. comment Sujit, to your question on the quantum computing uh, issue, right? I think Sun uh, Sunil is addressing a very important problem because, uh, and, and to his point about the acceleration, uh, I'll give you a viewpoint here that while we may think that quantum full scale quantum computers for general purpose computation may still be somewhat away, but what's happening is that there are uh, innovations happening in uh, using quantum simulations to start to prepare for those scenarios. Because you know, when quantum computers come, it's not like you're gonna start changing your mobile phone or your computer on a desk with a quantum computer. Actually, it will not happen that way. Quantum computer will likely sit in a, in a cloud. Okay, and you're gonna have regular computation that calls certain, certain specific routines to be solved with a quantum computer, which means you're gonna need a full stack approach to thinking about quantum computing. So, which is why it is not just the hardware part of it, it's the software, it's the applications, it's the uh, development kit, all of that. So, what we are doing is we are saying, let the quantum computers come, but you can still already have quantum simulators on top of which you can build your entire quantum algorithm, which can then seamlessly move to a quantum computer as it moves. That's one part. Second part is that quantum computing by itself is allowing certain kinds of optimizations which we call as quantum inspired optimizations. Those are being used to solve large scale optimization problem. Think of it as logistics or traffic management or drug discovery, many such optimization problems, right? Those problems are also getting new algorithms are coming up which are more quantum inspired. So much is happening in that space beyond saying that we have to directly go to a full scale quantum computer. There's a path towards getting there. Okay. okay. Just to add a very important uh, example, Microsoft uh, has Redmond connecting to their Scotland under undersea data center on post quantum cryptography algorithm. So they are already a, a place like Cisco, Microsoft already deploying some of the uh, post quantum cryptography solutions. Okay. 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 Yeah. Vinay, sorry. I, you had to talk about your... <laughs> hey, hey, thanks, uh, Sid. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with Sunil uh, in terms of, you know, the role that NASCOM played, but then uh, let me just give a brief overview of what we did uh, before uh, DTC and how DTC actually helped us. Uh, my product group, uh, Path Partner, has been there for 15 years and we have been doing uh, uh, product engineering services for most of the large, uh, well-known names, like, you know, uh, large companies. But uh, about five years back, when I got to know that uh, India is the world capital for uh, fatal road accidents, it's about one and a half lakh people die every year. You know, so it's about uh, 400 people we lose every day. That's that's a huge number. Uh, when I got to know about this, I thought like hey, we should do something about this, and uh, spoke to my other uh, path partner founders. We set up this team, and uh, for six months, I searched for the right talent. And uh, we had to have someone with a research background because uh, this was not something that was, you know, like uh, readily available or, or definitely not a very uh, available technology at that time, about five to six years back. And uh, so we took a couple of, uh, we took a PhD guy and then a couple of people with that research background. 
deep learning was still not that prevalent. Uh, we, we still didn't have NVIDIA GPU cards readily available in India. So we went, we, we actually sat in IAC deep learning. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Ambedkar really helped us in the initial days to conceptualize the problem. And so uh, the first two years went in understanding the, how do we collect data? What's the importance of data? How do we build prototypes to collect data from the driver? So we, we all, all kinds of associations, whether it's Uber, Ola driver associations, we had collected data from the airport taxi flying guys because they normally fall asleep in the early mornings, right? So. So we got a lot of data, we collected, you know, heart rate information and all this. And uh, uh, we once we knew that this, we are up to something, right? We are able to predict with very good accuracy, but maybe on servers, not still on embedded platforms. And that's when the engineering part of it started. So there were, uh, you know, the tie-ups with semiconductor companies like Qualcomm, Intel, and, and uh, we brought in our algorithms on these uh, processes. But when it came to go-to-market approaches and strategies, that's where I was actually finding myself uh, alone, uh, mostly on from the, uh, even though we had a, a good bandwidth, leadership bandwidth with Path Partner, but this deep tech uh, uh, technology, how do we take it to market was something that none of us act, had actually done before. So uh, that's when, you know, the NASCAM DTC really helped in, uh, with, I mean, from uh, Subinder who actually, uh, he, he, it is something like handholding a kid. Uh, how do you actually articulate your value proposition, right? How do you say, uh, how, how do you basically take your audience through the storytelling, right? It started from there. And I was like really amazed by the kind of uh, mentorship that we got, whether it was Milin Nanjimani or Atul Anupam. In fact, um, I, I got access to one of the best industry world lead, I mean, leaders, you know, whether it was Rostov. Rostov actually spent, you know, from my entry, he spent two hours with us. And uh, he explained us how to go to market, how to partner with the uh, system integrators and, uh, and, you know, even Varchas or Ajay Bhaskar of Wipro. So these were some of the big names. And the access to these people really helped me refine my own approach. And that's where uh, I really thank uh, NASCOM DTC. And uh, uh, this is one of the groups where uh, you get something like a one is to one uh, uh, mentorship. So I had two horizontal mentors like Ritesh and uh, Rajesh, uh, Rajesh Ivasa and uh, Ritesh who actually helped uh, refine our uh, approach, marketing position and all that. We had almost four to five different sessions uh, you know, mostly on uh, uh, refining our approach, uh, saying what 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 works, what doesn't work, which one you should have uh, for the unit economics, you know, these kind of things. Uh, these are called diagnostic phases. That was really helpful as a startup. I'll tell you why this is needed because as a deep tech startup, you know, it's a it's a long gestation period. It's a patient capital, right? Now, if you go wrong uh, and you go wrong at a later stage in the company, uh, you basically uh, come down much more harsher, right? So, so this kind of a mentorship uh, is something that is needed early on. In fact, I, I even um, think that I should have applied about two years back to NASCOM DTC. But yeah, nevertheless, uh, it was one of the fortunate things that I got selected, and uh, yeah, we were we were very much benefited out of this. So, I just want to add to Vinay's kind word. You know, one thing that's very apparent over years of working with some really great founders is you know, telling the story is as important as building it. And historically, as you know, from India, you know, maybe we are more humble or, you know, although we speak all good English, you know, I, I think we need to get better at that. And that's been a lot of focus in the Deep Tech Club. And, you know, it's been a great learning for all of us as well. You know, how do you pitch and how do you tell your story and how do you, you know, crisply articulate the value proposition and, you know, how are you faster, better, cheaper, right? So against, I mean, compared to our, North American, you know, peers, right? That's, uh, you know, one area where, you know, we're really trying to improve and I think we're making good progress there. Okay, okay. But give us an idea, I mean, how good, for, it's for all four, four of you, how, where does India stand now and um, how good are we? We keep hearing about the SaaS-based companies particularly making enormous progress and all that. Uh, generally speaking, how good are, is India in the space now compared to some of the... Uh, other leading company or countries yeah i mean uh, before that right like i just wanted to show a simple slide on uh, what kind of um, uh, areas a dtc company would go through that mm -hmm. will actually uh, help us you know uh, take it to the next stage for example you know like any uh, 
a deep tech company would have uh, core research. The two valley of deaths that Sunil was talking about, that's about research is the first valley. Engineering, getting it up is the second and third one is the scale, right? Uh, getting to market. So all the players, whether it is uh, government or the ecosystem uh, have a role. For example, when we are doing research, we uh, look for grants, rebates from the government, tie ups with academics and even with the intellectual property, like protecting and valuing the intellectual property. This is one of the biggest challenges I see in some of the startups uh, in India and uh, identifying what is intellectual property and protecting it, applying for it early on is a very important uh, aspect. In terms of engineering, yeah, we're all very good at engineering, but where we actually fall short is making right kind of partnerships. Like uh, most of us are in the mentality that uh, if I hire someone, I'll be able to do it myself instead of spending money and time, more than money, it's the time that uh, really uh, loses um, the attraction, right? So the right, making the right kind of technology partnership is very key and having a stake in the standardization, right? Um, uh, for the country or for the geography that you're working on is uh, very important. We shouldn't lose sight there. And uh, when it comes to the market, it's again, um, whether it, like how Sunil was telling, it could be in terms of government procurements or how do you tie up with the right kind of go to market partners, having an eye on the supply chain logistics, which is, which is a very big thing. Like when recently, uh, you know, we know what happened, right? Like, um, this kind of an havoc can really be a very big problem for a DTC company. So uh, NASCOM DTC really plays a very big role. In, uh, currently they are connecting the companies with the right kind of academics, uh, putting together, you know, the peer partnership. Like the, for example, there is a company called Cyclops in my cohort. Now we partner with them on eye tracking. So they work on medical devices. We work on driver monitoring, but the uh, core research is more or less similar, right? So it's better to uh, partner with them and get to market faster. And the GTM partners for me in terms of NASCOM, like all the connections that NASCOM has been making is very key to get, for example, uh, we work with Bosch. Bosch is one of our lead, uh, lead customers who are procuring our units and they are installing it in uh, you know, uh, uh, large OEM trucks. So our product is today going on the highway and the kind of connections that uh, you know, Atul made uh, really helped us here. So, so DTC helps has a play in all these three uh, uh, areas, but uh, there are of course gaps. I'm sure uh, Sunil and others are going to talk about it. But uh, what I feel is like today, uh, there's good amount of angel available, seed is available, uh, but where we are kind of falling short is on the series A, but I do see large venture capital like Axel and uh, uh, you know even Bloom uh, coming in. Uh, yeah, so D NASCOM DTC is actually putting them uh, into the DTC club. I hope this uh, really takes off. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sujana, the final things. Okay. Uh, sorry, the, sorry, Atul, go on. In terms of where we are wearing my other hat, Algonomy, as you know, you know, Algonomy was previously called Manthan, and we're an India company and uh, 15 years in the making and, uh, you know, selling in actually almost 30 countries now. and. I would say we are one of the leading independent players for customer and marketing analytics, targeting and personalization outside of the large platforms like Adobe and Salesforce. So we, and there are a lot of success stories like Algonomy, right? And uh, so I think, and these all of, our, you know, these companies are fundamentally deep tech companies, AI companies, you know, uh, we've been doing machine learning for many, many years and applying it in all our use cases. So uh, and that's where I think, you know, more of these success stories need to come out and, you know, all of us need role models. And that's part of the objective of the Deep Tech Club as well. You know, and what we want is, you know, people like Vinay and Sunil, as they spend more time in the club, we want to, we want them to come back as mentors and mentor the next generation of entrepreneurs that join the club. Yeah, from, okay. uh, yeah. so, Rohini, Rohini, I want to bring you in. Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, you, you will have a global perspective. Where do we stand? Where does India stand in the space now? And uh, what are, oh, in your perspective, what are some of the lacunae where, where areas that we need to improve on? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good point. I think it's, it's very good to uh, see, and I've been part of the journey as well with NASCOM in terms of the deep tech club, right? But I think it is, it is now to our also earlier discussion, it is now time for us to really scale beyond the big, big metros to really take the 
the startup revolution to the tier two, tier three towns uh, and, and drive that kind of momentum, right? And, uh, and so, the, so the pandemic has sort of shown us that location is a little bit irrelevant. Of course, it, it matters to still be having face-to-face -face conversations, but again, the mindsets have changed in a big way, right? And so I think the, the element of really going uh, to our to a tier two, tier three towns is, is really important. Um, and, and to the other point, you know, yes, yes, we are starting on that journey, but uh, and, and the recent report is talking about the number of unicorns uh, in the country, the 100 unicorns in the country. I think, I think it, is, it is a good indication of what's possible, right? It's still only an indication of what's possible. I think the scale is still ahead of us, and which is what goes back to my earlier point I was making about, uh, you know, the digital uh, uh, uptake, mobile phone uptake, because in a way, India has the opportunity to really become that lab for the world. Uh, that lab for the entire emerging markets, and we are we are breaking the molds, right? In terms of what proof, what price points, what problems to solve, uh, what what should be the uh, the customer interface? In terms of just the diversity of languages, diversity of use cases, the the severity of problems. Think about healthcare, education, right? So I think we have the lab here to make things at a whole different scale. And I think we are just starting on that journey. And so to me, I think uh, in a way, the, all the discussion that we are having in terms of the mentorship uh, that, that NASCOM DTC is providing, uh, the kind of uh, you know, uh, investments that's where we are, we are getting, I think it's very early signs for us to, to really take off because the, the both the, the manpower and, and the other, other element, which is on skills, which I want to talk about. I think the importance of skills is going to be critical because uh, you know, never before has a, a generation of people graduating who's what they have learned in college going to be so quickly superfluous so quickly completely out of date right because the pace at which technology is moving which means that some of the things that nascom is doing and of course others are doing in terms of future skills future skills prime which is about learning some of these technologies in in bite-sized things because not going to be like you learn from college and you come out and you are set for life you're going to have to keep on learning so that element of skill development in these deep tech areas and the fact that these problems are in our backyard and the digitization, I think these have a positive thing. So I think we are just starting on that journey. It's hard to say where, I mean, I think we are just starting on that journey. And uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the good good uh, sort of tea leaves are there, but, but there's so much more to do that, uh, you know, I feel like even putting a number on it is, is a little bit uh, uh, perilous if I, if I put it that way. Sunil wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to add another dimension to it, <laughs> especially from a quantum side. It, it's been a, uh, absolutely a, a different uh, experience. See, my my view is that uh, there needs to be uh, unconditional support, right? Come in the early phases for deep tech companies, right? Uh, because what happens is that if um, uh, right now funding is very important, as everybody said, that the gestation period for deep tech is is long. Right, uh, it takes about two years, three years, even before you get a meaningful product, you get it certified. So, which means that you need to have some early funding. You need to have a patient funding, right? And um, and and so, thus, it is very important that uh, if if uh, if uh, VCs try to put um, the same template they had for the non deep tag onto the deep tag and say, show me early customer, show me early revenue. It won't. It it probably won't fit in there, right? For example, we were very fortunate. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been existing today if we didn't have uh, a unique set of angel investors who who funded company just because they had a passion, single-minded uh, objective to build a global deep tech company from India, and they chose quantum as a space, right? And uh, and uh, it is an unconditional. Why I'm using the word unconditional because they have been putting the money in the company unconditional uh, way because they know that. And every time when I go to them, I, I, I feel bad, right? That I'm asking money, but they say, no, no, we know that it will take more time. Don't worry, don't worry, keep doing. So that support, right? So that support needs to come from the industry. That needs to come from the funding uh, ecosystem. What about that, the government? Don't you think the government should also be putting in substantial funds? Yeah, of, course. of course, government has the right intent, but I think there is some challenge in terms of how quickly the money comes up and then they have a challenge of distributing the uh, money to too many people, then it becomes too, uh, too small a, uh, you know, a quantum for anybody to become. So they have to identify 
sufficient chunk of money instead of companies and build some role model examples that everybody can follow, right? So otherwise, it becomes as uh, Vinay was also pointing that right, angel funding, pre pre seed you can get uh, pre series A, but that real money comes in at a seed level, right? And that is where the real support has to come in to really push that uh, you know uh, the companies to a different orbit, right? So that uh, is very very important. Shilpa. Uh, Atul, you spoke about uh, the need for role models. If you look at how the SaaS ecosystem has evolved, you have Zoho, Freshworks, Isertis, all of them breaking the $100 million ARR mark, right? So uh, if you can help us understand how, you know, uh, things are stacking up in the deep tech ecosystem, if you can call out uh, some of the names where uh, companies are promising and how they are shaping up. Mm. So Shilpa, these days, you know, um, deep tech is the new plumbing, right? It's not a distinct company. It's become a horizontal. It's become a imperative, right? I mean, every company needs to have that's dealing with data needs to employ machine learning. If you're doing, uh, you know, uh, doing other type of interfaces, you need to incorporate NLP. You need to look at quantum if there's a place. So it's, it's more use case based. Uh, but, you know, I want to go back to, you know, what Sujit mentioned in terms of what do we, how do we enable the potential of our ecosystem? And I think, you know, on, on the government side, by the way, I think the government is making the right moves. I'm part of the National Software Product Mission. There's actually a point program where the government will co-invest money for, uh, you know, investment into research and academia from, from uh, you know, our product companies, right? So, uh, you know, to me, you know, there's a couple of gaps and opportunities if you look at it that way that we need to solve. You know, the first one for me is, you know, the number one metric to be a world-class deep tech company is essentially like the panelist said is the quantum of R&D investment, right? So yes, solve customer problems, but uh, deep tech innovation is also finding new ways to solve the problem. So if you look at a typical SaaS company's metrics, you can apply them here, but you know, like everyone mentioned, you need to look at it slightly in a distinct fashion, right? And I think we've barely hit 1% of use cases that can be solved via deep tech. And when you look at India, and you know, many of us call it the, you know, India class problems, that's a huge uh, space, right? So patient capital, just the nature of building deep tech requires significant R&D uh, and long gestation periods, right? So uh, I agree, I think the India venture capital, you know, community, which is, you know, doing their bit, but most of them may not understand the space deeply, right? And they may look for typical metrics. So I think it's an education evolution. And the part of the charter of the club is to bring everyone together and increase that awareness, right? That's number one. Number two, and this is very important. I feel that India Inc., which is our Indian businesses, right? Need to come to what I call the startup party, right? We need to create a culture of early adopters and experimentation in India. And, you know, Silicon Valley is as much a adoption story as it is an innovation story, right? And today we have too much reliance on global markets, right? So we have to really push hard on this make in India, made for India, Atma Nirbhar, and really make it reality, right? And I think the challenges, and that's, again, the charter of the club, innovation is not well understood. You know, um, I argue that more than the entrepreneur, you know, Sunil and uh, Vinay, Vinay here, right? I think our businesses need uh, you know, deep tech more, right? And if you look, uh, you know, my thesis is in the next five years, if every business in India has not embraced deep tech, right? And integrated it into every business process, every role, uh, they may be on a death spiral. And we have to just look at the graveyard of Fortune 500 companies in the US, right? And look what Amazon has done to the retail market, right? So I think India Inc. needs to both consume, make in India deep tech products and also invest, fund and support them, you know, back to the patient capital, right? And businesses need to build a culture of experimentation. You know, a lot of good businesses have corporate innovation programs, right? So I think we need to look at the West and, you know, how they solve this, right? And uh, I think that's very, very important, right? Number three would be, you know, back to one of you mentioned, you know, uh, kind of, uh, PSUs, right? The strategic sectors. I think if you look at defense, which is a multi-trillion market globally, and that's one being disrupted continuously, right? Robots, drones are going to, you know, a legacy, a lot of the existing weapon systems, which are multi-trillion investments, right? Uh, 
railways, you know, space. ISRO recently opened up, you know, working with startups and all, right? And we keep hearing that, you know, in India, a lot of the tenders are only meant for large companies. So I think we need to change that whole paradigm, right? And, you know, we need to keep in mind that disruptive innovation is only possible at the entrepreneurial level, right? Really true disruptive innovation, right? And that's where, you know, the entrepreneur reimagines how to solve the same problem in a much faster, better, cheaper way, you know, using deep tech, right? And that's where, you know, the club is again playing a role. The fourth area is very important. And Sujit, you mentioned scientific research up front, right? Is about industry, industry, uh, the academy industry uh, collaboration, right? Today, uh, frankly, they don't talk to each other. I mean, it's very simple, right? To be very blunt. And I think we do have good exceptions like the Indian Institute of Science, our IITs and all, but if you look at scale, it doesn't exist. And there, you know, there are two simple flows. You know, what happens in the US, right? Uh, we need to fund a lot of scientific research in research and academia and reverse flow. We need IP coming back into products, right? In particular for a deep tech sector, right? I mean, you know, like I went to the US in my master's program, you know, I remember my professor has raised over $60 million just by himself for his lab, right? I mean, we need this kind of scale happening in India. The, you know, the, the fifth thing I'll mention is, you know, today the majority of the markets for deep tech is, you know, in the Western world. So we need to jumpstart, you know, global market access programs for India deep tech companies, especially as startups, right? Uh, we need to take them to industry shows, give them booths, uh, give them seats in the US so that they can start selling there. I think a global SIs can play a big role in, you know, in kind of bootstrapping them, right? So uh, the GTM part is very, very important. And the last thing I'll mention, which is not talked about enough is, you know, product management. You know, essentially it's, you know, Shilpa, it's about what problem you're solving, not the technology, right? And so I think we need to bring more product thinking. Product management is kind of the crown jewel role there. And I'm happy to note at NASCOM, we have a large community doing product scaling and the goal is to create 50,000 product managers by 2025. It's a very audacious goal, but uh, hopefully that will help, you know, really push forward our deep tech sector as well. Vinay, I know, I know you wanted to speak, but uh, just a related question for Atul from uh, Deepan Shagarwal. Where are we failing when it comes to storytelling? Um, do you think the conservative approach of Indian founders may be responsible for it? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of culture, humility. I think, look, we're all good English speakers. Uh, and it takes practice. You know, like if you look at the US, uh, you know, from nursery, they tell you how to tell stories, right? And here, you know, our focus is on, you know, root learning and all that. So it's kind of our, you know, what we go through, you know, kind of the factory uh, system that we go through. But, uh, you know, I I've seen that when we work on it, I think, you know, we do very well. You know, and, and, and we've focused a lot in the club on workshops. Sujit, uh, we've literally spent hundreds of hours uh, bringing in a lot of experts. You know, like everyone spoke about Subinder. He's, he's like laser focused on storytelling. And, you know, how do you, how do, you do the elevator pitch? How do you do the, you know, the one hour pitch, right? How do you pitch to the investor? How do you pitch to a business, you know, a prospect, right? Uh, so th those have their nuances. So I think we, we are getting better. Vinay, you want thought I saw you raising your hand. Uh, you yeah, say? actually, I just uh, wanted to tell about what else is needed for the deep tech uh, companies in India. One thing is uh, the large companies, especially the, uh, the, um, the service companies who have a lot of reserves, they have to come to the party, right? So as we say, they, uh, if you do not see a lot of their participation in uh, deep tech companies, it could be either in terms of investments or it could be in terms of uh, procurement. And uh, uh, as, as Atul was telling that uh, deep tech is the only thing that can build a deep moat for their businesses. Otherwise, without that moat, right? So they, it's going to be very difficult for most of them to survive in the next decade. Uh, in come, in, then the second point is uh, on the R&D policy. Uh, even Path Partner is a, uh, a Department of Science and Technology recognized R&D unit and I'm the R&D head. And we could uh, somehow uh, utilize uh, those provisions and take tax benefits and that helped us build this kind of investment from our company. But most of the startups will not be able to do this, right? So, so uh, I, I guess government has to uh, provide uh, the same uh, policy applicable for larger companies when they invest in deep tech. So they get tax benefits on those investments. 
uh, there are capital gains which are very high on unlisted companies, right? So compared to the listed companies, now at least it has to be not just brought into the same same level, but instead it should go down. So when when there are patient investors investing in deep tech companies, they should get tax rebates, or at least their capital gains should be taxed less, right? So we don't see a large uh, <clears throat> exits in deep tech. It's too early, I know. Like like the flip cards, we don't have many exits here. There are few, for example, I hear Gray Orange or Agnicole, and we have we have some successful companies even in like uh, QNU Labs or Vsense. I hear some of them doing very well, and I hope uh, there will be more exits that will in, in fact inspire more uh, founders to take this riskier path. Because uh, here, what you basically do here is run a marathon, uh, right? It's not a sprint. You 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 cannot fail fast. <laughs> you come to deep tech, you just cannot afford to fail fast. Okay. So then, uh, Rohini, Rohini also mentioned the yeah, skills no. issue. I mean, for uh, for quantum and all that, I mean, skills, how, how can you produce those skills required? You yeah, do it for yeah. yourself, but on a scale basis, how do you do it? Yeah, see, uh, the way it needs to do is, uh, first is, um, you know, academia partnership is very, very important, right? Because some of the uh, skills are available there. Uh, we need to uh, bring them uh, uh, with us. Uh, you know, for example, we are uh, one of our uh, uh, academy partner is a professor at uh, at Harvard, right? He's the head of physics department. Um, so uh, having such people and uh, and uh, helping their uh, their uh, you know their community, right? To 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 give some lectures, help us build some basic skills in this uh, special area. Then what happens? You'll be surprised. Uh, as we been pr promoting ourselves in the in the social media in the last uh, three four years, we get you will be surprised. And uh, some of the engineers have told us who joined us as intern and then joined us this thing that they started. They took quantum physics as an expert ex as a specialized area because of seeing the companies like Kimu Labs coming in, right? So there's so many uh, P guys doing PhDs and internships and now and the pool is increasing. Right, we get almost 50, 60, you know, every quarter, uh, uh, you know, for internship. Of course, we have to invest a lot of time, but being a pioneer in this field, we believe that is our responsibility. Otherwise, this will never come up. So, so that is one part. And then, um, uh, second part is, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are creating a core team uh, and then uh, who has this specialized expertise and 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 then keep building, uh, you know, uh, like a hub and spoke type of thing, right? We have a core team today, then we slowly nurture smaller teams around that and who then get uh, you know that capabilities and that's where the pool is increasing and then what we have also done also br brought in some partners uh, technology partners who are now uh, doing some uh, you know um, uh, projects with, uh, with us now of course they don't get to do a core quantum technology uh, but over a period of time they have started understanding because they're participating with us in some solutioning with customers. So what has happened over the last uh, 12, 18 months that we have grown a team beyond our 40 people, 45 people to almost about 100 people ecosystem that we have, right? Over now, 100. Yeah, over 100, right? So, and to us, that is going to now go to a, you know, next ring of, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem and the talent pool that will happen. Having said that, is a, is a challenging because it is a, one side, uh, you have a challenge in terms of money. Second thing is that you have to, uh, train those young people, have patience. So it's, it's a is is a is a is a is a tough, uh, very tough um, uh, journey. Uh, but there's no other no other way to do that. <laughs> Shilpa or Rohini wanted to say something. Yeah, no, I was just going to add, particularly on quantum, right? We've been working with IIT Ranchi and Triple IT Hyderabad in terms of, in fact, uh, putting together, not putting together, in fact, there is a course that's running there. We have trained the professors. Uh, we have development kits as well as language because earlier, as I was mentioning, right, quantum is about having a full stack approach. Uh, so there is a significant investment to put together even what a semester long course looks like. Uh, so we are working with these two institutes and of course it, it needs to scale more. But I think the element of skill, particularly because it's not just you can start today and tomorrow you'll start having a, a whole generation of quantum uh, quantum specialists because it's a whole different paradigm in the way you want to think about computing. So therefore the skill development needs to start now. I want to put out there that, that those efforts, efforts are there in the market. And the earlier point, which was coming up, just the last thought, right, on the on the storytelling part. I think while while we are technologists and we love technology, but I think it's also important for us to be able to tell the story for the customer. Uh, 
because we're going to have to tell the story for the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so people will have to learn that skill and along with the deep tech skills uh, and for, along with that some confidence, which is obviously where NASCOM is playing a role. Shilpa? This question is from Nalani Bhaskar. Israel and its startups are able to prove and bring investments value in AI and semiconductors. Why is India not able to bring the same? Is it lack of innovation or smart people? <laughs> Who wants to take that? Atul? Yeah, I mean, look, we have, we have the smartest people in the world. I mean, I, I think there's a metric of how many out of 10 AI people are of Indian origin, right? It's a very high number, more than five. But uh, so it's, it's about uh, evolution, right? I mean, if we go back, our B2B ecosystem is barely a decade, decade and a half old, right? And I think the cycles are being compressed. Israel has been very focused around certain sectors like security and all. They've, it goes back to many of the things we talked about, like, you know, scientific research, you know, the ability to sell globally, uh, the ecosystem support. So I think it's all happening. I, you know, I, you know, I predict that, you know, in the next two to three decades, you know, we could be top three with US and China if we do the right things, right? Um, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, the potential. And I mean, the scale of problems that we'll solve in India for India is humongous. And, you know, we can take them to the world. And then, of course, we solve existing use cases, you know, in Western markets. And, you know, and th there's the early adopters and there's the digital laggards, right? So we sit in the part of the world where it's digital laggards, where we're still investing in infrastructure and all that, right? So I think, uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot of appetite to move faster, but, uh, you know, the, things will take time, and but they are being compressed. Uh, in fact, uh, to add to Atul, right, I guess even uh, in, um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So Israel is definitely uh, in a much, much harsher uh, geography, and they have to invest. Either they invest or they perish, and they have been doing this for a lot of decades now. And fortunately and unfortunately, yeah, India has been... Uh, May not be in a very great uh, geography, but we do have a more uh, uh, more luxury in on that side, right? And we have our priorities, of course. Uh, the country has a priority, uh, has other priorities. I guess now we are just getting started. Uh, Atul, there's a question for you from uh, Jatin. Um, suggest a way for people that uh, to the first step. What should be the first step they should take? Okay, so uh, shameless plug on behalf of the community. Please come. <laughs> be part of our deep tech community, you know, and, and part of the NASCOM ecosystem. And it's very grounds up, it's grassroots movement. All the people on the webinar here are great contributors. There's no entitlement. It's all merit-based. So you can uh, Google for NASCOM deep tech club, right? And you can apply either as a, as a mentee startup. You, if you can apply as a mentor, you can apply as a partner. You could be a academic institution. You could be an investor. You could be a business. Uh, you know, we aspire to build this, you know, for the long haul and be, you know, make significant impact globally, not just for India. So please come join our community. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shilpa? No more questions in the queue yet. So, uh, you know, I'll, uh, of course, almost run out of time, but uh, give me some predictions from each of you. I mean, where will India be? I mean, Atul already mentioned. Uh, what do you say we'll be... I mean, uh, I next to uh, US and China, within what period you said? Top three by 2050, if if the right things happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, my current has just gone off. So I'm off. And I'm talking <laughs> about, Sujit, I'm talking about in terms of innovation. You know, business is one thing, but to be an innovator is the hard thing. So I think mm -hmm. it will take us two, three decades if we work on some of the things we've talked about and we really focus. Okay, okay. Rohini, you want to make some predictions for India? I think, you know, I think India will define how data is uh, is leveraged, is used, is uh, is is uh, is is what what Satya calls something called data dignity, uh, and the idea about data being belonging to the person from who the data has emanated. I think India is going to be the leader in how data is used, and we are moving towards a world which is more and more data centric. So I feel that uh, without getting into numbers, particularly, I think India is going to define how the next, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, 
how data defined businesses are defined, how it's used, what it means for an individual, how value from data is determined, and who captures that value. I think in, in many ways, there is a leadership role for India uh, as against what the West has done in terms of how data is used versus what China has done. I feel India is going to be leading the world in this space. Okay. Sunil Vinay, last words. Yeah, Sunil is muted. Yeah, I was saying that uh, my view is that India would be uh, would be the world's alternative to uh, quantum alternative to China in terms of quantum security products. Yeah, I think there's no other country in the world that can offer a scalable uh, value for money in quantum security products, which China almost uh, nobody's going to buy from them. And that is what I think in three years we think that India would be the alternative to China. Oh, world. really? So you're saying uh, sheer, because of the sheer numbers of uh, engineers and all that we have, is it? Number, uh, uh, the manufacturing setup. Uh, right now, the Telangana government is putting up a, a world-class uh, quantum uh, manufacturing hub uh, in terms of R&D as well as manufacturing. For photonics, is a convergence of photonics, quantum electronics. Uh, nobody in the world has done that. So uh, in, in, uh, in one and a half years, we will have that uh, world-class manufacturing setup. So, so world has to do. I mean, the, today it is expected that in the next uh, 24 months, the world would need a lot more quantum security boxes and devices that only India can provide. Okay. What are we manufacturing? Sorry, in quantum, what is it that we manufacture? So we build the quantum, uh, is, is a, is, we call it a quantum key distribution and quantum random number generator boxes that sit in the data center and and up and it actually upgrade the classical cryptography to quantum safe cryptography. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, and and that and that's what is going to happen in the next two to three years. Okay. Yeah. Vinay. Yeah. Actually, uh, India will continue to be a scale, you know, for a test bed for the technologies at scale because the India kind of provides that scale, which where you don't get it anywhere else. But to be a preferred market. I, as I think uh, India's GDP has to grow at least three more, three times more than what it is today. And that's when we'll have a very viable market here. We still don't have tech early adopters, either in terms of B2B or uh, spaces that need to really improve. So I would, I'm, I'm the, probably the only guy painting a very grim picture here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, yeah, so I just, yeah, you're right. So like, if you look at certain markets, uh, Sujit, I mean, the US is 10 times SARC not just India today. And that's where I think we are digital laggards. And since we have no legacy, if, you know, that's where the India in coming to the party, if they start adopting and experimenting with technology and make it a comp, you like Reliance has done that, right? And you see them dominating. They're a technology company as much as a business, right? So I think that will happen. That realization will happen and people won't have a choice and that will create the pull, hopefully. That's true. Okay. So, to summarize, I mean, we have phenomenal talent in all of these spaces. Um, we have fundamental problems that need to be solved and these technologies can be used to solve those. And if India Inc. can pitch in by encouraging all of these technologies, then the potential is just enormous. As Atul said, by 2050, we could be, I mean, right next to the US and China. And to help you through this, NASCOM's Deep Tech Club uh, doing some phenomenal work uh, right from your initial baby steps to seeing you through up to the market. Uh, some great uh, initiatives being taken by the Deep Tech Club. Uh, thanks for a great discussion. And um, we hope uh, Atul's predictions come true. Thank thanks a lot to all of you, Atul, Rohini, Sunil, Vinay. Thank, thank you. You guys have done a great job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.